Acts chapter 1 and the first phrase which just thrills me because I believe it includes most of you. Dear friend who loves God, in my first letter I told you about Jesus' life and teaching and how he returned to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions from the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time actually alive and proved to them in many ways that it was really he himself they were seeing. And on these occasions he talked to them about the kingdom of God. In one of these meetings he told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them in fulfilment of the Father's promise, a matter he had previously discussed with them. John baptized you with water, he reminded them, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. And another time when he appeared to them, they asked him, Lord, are you going to free Israel from Rome now and restore to us as an independent nation? The Father sets those dates, he replied, and they are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power to testify about me with great effort, effect to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth about my death and resurrection. It was not long afterwards that he rose into the sky and disappeared into a cloud, leaving them staring after him. As they were straining their eyes for another glimpse, suddenly two white-robed men were standing there among them and said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has gone away to heaven and some day, just as he went, he will return. They were at the Mount of Olives when this happened, so now they walked the half mile back to Jerusalem and held a prayer meeting in an upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here is a list of those who were present at the meeting. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, also called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and the brothers of Jesus. Several women, including Jesus' mother, were also there. This prayer meeting went on for several days. During this time on a day when about 120 people were present, Peter stood up and addressed them. Tonight is a kind of postscript to our studies in the book of Acts. We've now been right through all 28 chapters and we finished this morning. And yet there were certain questions left in my mind after the whole series that I want to share with you. Burdens that are very much on my heart because studying the Bible is not just an academic thing that we do and then leave and say, well, we've done that book. It's God speaking. And God's word needs not only to be heard, it needs to be obeyed. And it's what we do about what we hear that is going to count in the last analysis. And I want to look back over the whole of the book of Acts and draw from it some of the lessons I can on the theme of mission, evangelism, outreach, fishing for men. I've chosen one text from the whole book of Acts to pinpoint my burden for tonight. And it's this. I will give you what I have. Now that's a modern translation, but I guess many of you will know straight away where it comes from. I'll tell you later. But this is my text for tonight. I will give you what I have. You can't, of course, give anybody what you don't have, but what you do have you can keep to yourself. And it was Simon Peter who said this, I will give you what I have. Now one of the biggest changes that has taken place in the churches of England churches in England, I mean, during the last ten years has been this. Ten years ago, church people in England were preoccupied with the question of church unity. The ecumenical issue was top of the agenda, and a lot of time and energy was being spent in this way. The steam has now gone out of that movement. And a far healthier concern has taken its place. Instead of the concern for unity, there is now percolating through the church circles of this land a concern for mission. 
and from the introvert self-examination has come a healthy extrovert concern we've woken up at last to the fact that England is not a Christian country if it ever was it certainly is not now we've woken up to the fact that we're in a missionary situation and that the vast majority of our fellow countrymen here do not know Christ and are driving to hell in their Jaguars and that's the new realization that is causing a new concern for mission my estimate is that I can only myself find about 1.5 percent of the population in this country knowing and loving Christ as Savior and Lord 1.5 which means that 98.5 are lost and therefore throughout this country there is a growing concern that is being expressed in calls to evangelism and mission which are coming at us from many quarters in the north of England there has been call to the north here in this diocese there is call to mission unlimited through the evangelical alliance there is a call to start next year a mission under the title of power and these calls are going to go on coming well thank God that they reveal a concern but these calls raise big questions what is mission what are we going out to do who is lost and who needs saving and how do we save them many many questions are going to be raised and we've got to wrestle with these questions but the most disturbing thing is that churches have woken up to the fact that they are not geared to mission for at least two generations now we have been geared to maintaining the status quo in our churches we have been geared to dwindling congregations we have got used to the denominational headquarters of every major denomination in this country issuing declining statistics year after year after year since the first world war the graph has been going down and down and therefore we've been geared to maintaining the status quo we've been geared to keeping the, the thing going we've been more concerned with committees than conversions and we've managed to keep the machine going but at what a spiritual cost but at last we're beginning to realize that it's not the people in the church that we should be concerned about it's the vast number outside as Bishop Leslie Newbigin of South India has said the church is the only society on earth that exists primarily for its non-members now we've been studying the book of Acts to try and learn more about mission to ask what's it all about what are we sent to do what is this mission that God wants us to complete so that one day we can stand before him and say Lord mission accomplished what does he want us to do to be able to say that and we've been right through the book of Acts to find the answer it covers the first 30 years of Christianity and I want to repeat now something I said this morning I believe that the only part of church history that is in the Bible namely the first generation is limited to that because that is what God wanted us to know that was his ideal period if you like that was his golden age that was the period in which he set the pattern for the church of all ages until the Lord Jesus Christ returns and it is to that period that we look to learn about mission and I'm just going to share with you tonight some of the thoughts that have been running through my mind as I've studied the whole book of Acts and then I'm going to share with you four devastating questions which I'm not sure that I can answer honestly and openly tonight and I'm not sure you can either but I've got to share them with you the Lord has told me to let's start with some general observations and the first thing I noticed is this God uses people to do his purpose people there is not a single thing in the book of Acts that God does without people the condescension of it the amazing grace behind it that God will not do things in Guildford without people he wants us to cooperate he wants us to be his co-workers the channels of his blessing so God uses people individual people not crowds 
He chooses a man and a woman and he uses them. And they're not special people. That's even more thrilling. They're not great people. They're not outstanding people in education or in background. Just ordinary people God uses. And that's exciting. You couldn't have a greater contrast than Peter and Paul, a rough fisherman and a university educated lawyer, but they dominate the book of Acts and show you the range of people that God can use. You are not, any of you, a person whom God could not use. Everybody can be used by God. I notice, second, that not only does God use individuals, but he uses individuals who are not individualist. Do you know the difference? An individual is a person. An individualist is a person who wants to act alone. We've all met them, those who work best on a committee of one. But you know, in the book of Acts, they do not act as individualists. Individuals, yes, Peter, Paul, Stephen, Philip, outstanding people in God's grace. And yet they always act as part of a team, part of a family. They don't go out in ones, they go out in twos. They are sent out by the fellowship. They are welcomed back by the fellowship. It's always the community of love reaching out through its members. A lovely combination of the individual and the family cooperating together to do God's will. But the question that was in my mind as I read through Acts was this. What had they got? What was the secret behind their evangelism? Because judged by any standard, this first 30 years was the most successful the church has ever seen in proportion to its numbers. They started with 11 men. Then there was a prayer meeting of 120 then on the first public preaching, 3,000. A few months later, 5,000 men, which meant that the church was already over 10,000 people with the women and young people. Not only did they grow numerically, they grew socially. From slaves and beggars to governors and a chancellor of the exchequer. And not only numerically and socially, but geographically, within that single generation, they had jumped into two new continents, into Europe and Africa. What did they have that we don't have? For patently, obviously, we are not up to their standards of mission. What did they have that we haven't? And you know, as I pondered that question, the Lord gave me a most surprising answer. He said, you've got the question wrong way round. You should start by asking, what did they not have that we have? And as soon as I asked that, light dawned. They didn't have money. Silver and gold have I none. They had to make that confession. So the size of the collection was not a factor in their mission, nor is it a factor in ours. They didn't have any buildings. We've been blessed with a lovely building which God in his mercy gave us. But if we rely on the building to do our work, it'll never be done. They didn't have any buildings. They had no denominational headquarters. They had no think tank, no group up at the top organizing the strategy. They were completely lacking in the kind of facilities we seem to think are necessary to modern church life. They had no schools. They had no hospitals. They were remarkably free of philanthropic organizations. In fact, the more I read, the more I'm convinced they were free from the things that make us trust in ourselves. And that the first secret of their successful mission was that they lacked the things that make us self-sufficient. And therefore they were driven back to God. Lacking human resources, they were thrown back on divine and therefore they were richer than we are. That's the first thing that hit me square between the eyes. Then I went deeper into it and asked, is there something in their method of evangelism that provides the secret? How did they set about winning people for Christ? And again, I noticed sharp contrast to the way in which we approach the task. For example, I noticed that they made straight for adults rather than children. 
Now it is ten times easier to get hold of children than adults. You can fill a Sunday school far more quickly than you can fill a church. But I noticed that they went straight for adults on the very sound principle that if you get the parents, you'll get the children. It does not follow, alas, and we've discovered it in this country, that if you get the children, you'll get the adults. It doesn't even follow that you'll keep the children. Six out of every seven children who've been in Sunday school will leave between the ages of 10 and 13. They went for adults. And I hope the ladies will forgive me for saying this. It's not intended as a man's lib statement. But they went for men rather than women. Again, it is easier to win women for Christ than men. But it does not follow that if you win the wife, you'll get the husband. But if you win the husband, the head of the, the home and the family, then, oh, what will follow? Look what happens when a Philippian jailer is converted. Look what happens when Stephanus is converted. And here was a strategy from which we could learn. Our top priority, I believe, in this land of ours is to win men. For Jesus Christ, I believe if we could do that, we'd see the wives and the families and we'd see so many others coming to Jesus. And then I looked at their strategy a little more deeply and I saw that they did not cheapen the gospel. They did not say all you've got to do is accept Jesus. They preached a full gospel. They included repentance from sin which is a vital part of the offer of Jesus Christ. It did include believing in Jesus, but that was a deep personal trust, not a mental assent to certain doctrinal statements. And they said, be baptized in water. The idea that that was an optional extra just never occurred to them. It was part of the Great Commission. And they went on to say, be filled with the Spirit. And they went on to guide the converts into church fellowships. Under elders, the idea of leading someone to Christ and not integrating them into a church would just not have occurred to them. So they preached a full gospel. Was this their secret? And then I looked at something else and here I began to feel very challenged myself. I realized that one of the secrets of their success was that they reached people through two of their senses and not just one. We have, as you know, five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. And they use two of those, not just one. From the very beginning, the gospel could be seen as well as heard. Have you noticed how often those two verbs come together? On the very day of Pentecost, Peter said, that which you see and hear. And later on when he was on trial for what he'd done for a, a lame beggar in the temple, as he stood in the dock, he said, let it be known that that which you see and know. And someone has said that in our day at least, one in the eye is better than two in the ear. What is meant by that? Just this, that if we just preach the gospel with our lips to people's ears, that's only half an apostolic gospel. Paul again and again says, when I came to you, I came with speech, trembling speech, yes, weakness and fear. And yet there was a demonstration, and the word he uses means a visible demonstration of power. Here are the two great avenues into a man's soul, what he hears and what he sees. And the apostles used both. For the people in the world not only heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, they saw things happen which have no human explanation. And I believe here is one of the deepest of their secrets. We're getting very near to the heart of the reason for their success. The gospel came in sign as well as word. Jesus had promised that it would. He told them to go and preach the gospel to every creature and he promised to be with them. And the result was, as we read, they went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord working with them, confirming that word with signs following. They not only heard, they saw. And there was a combination of the two channels and when people can see 
as well as hear the gospel, they're going to sit up and take notice. They cannot help but take notice. You can't ignore things that happen that have no human explanation. Why did those things happen? I must get deeper and deeper into this. What did these people have? Why were they able to do as well as to speak? Was it that they had a strategy? Was it that they were specially organized? No, it was what I'm going to call, and I've never seen this label used before, but I, and I don't hold any patent on it, but it's the kind of evangelism that I believe was there in the New Testament. I want to call it overspill evangelism. Overspill. These were not people digging down into their souls and scraping the bottom of the barrel for some little word to pass on to other people because they felt a compelled, compelling duty to go out and witness. These were people who were bursting. These were people who were spilling over. These were people who didn't sit down and ask, how can we start mission? These were people who couldn't stop it. And it's the difference between organized and organic evangelism. Now this week nearly 12,000 people will be meeting in London to discuss mission, to train for mission, to prepare for mission. And they will be given techniques and strategy will be discussed and tactics. But oh, pray that this week something may happen that will cause an overspill. When do you spill over? The answer is when you're full up. And if you're only a half full Christian, evangelism is a duty. It's more than that. It's sheer drudgery. And though you may peg away at it with dogged loyalty, God isn't going to use or bless it. The evangelism of the New Testament was not a group of Christians saying, we've got to evangelize. How can we do it? It was a group of Christians who were so full they spilled over. If you're full, it just needs a little movement for you to spill. And that's what was happening. Let me look at these early Christians and say two things about them which seem to me to get right to the point. Number one, they were all born again Christians. Of course, there's no other sort, but I want to say it because many of us who call ourselves Christians may not have been born again. To put it another way, this was the first generation of the Christian church and therefore it was made up of first generation Christians. And oh, what a joy it is to meet a first generation Christian. Again, there's really no such thing as a second generation Christian. That's the snare and the danger. God has no grandsons. He only has sons. But what I mean by it is this. I suffer as many of you to whom I'm speaking suffer from having been brought up in a Christian home. Now don't misunderstand me. I thank God for all the blessings that that now brings to me. For all that I was saved from by the standards I was given, by the pressures of family opinion and all the rest, but there are profound dangers in being brought up in a Christian home. Two in particular. Number one, that at that point where you become a teenager and want to be yourself and want to strike out and be an adult and make your own decisions, the awful danger is that you will identify that independence with freedom from your parents' religion. Many have done that. But the other danger is more subtle, and that is not that you will react against your parents' faith, but that you will submit to it without being born again. And those of us who've been brought up in church and brought up in Sunday school, second and third, I'm about the 17th generation Christian. Those of us who've had all that can lack the fire and the enthusiasm of discovering Christ for ourselves. We can lack that deep sense of grace that comes to those who've known what the far country is like, who've known what sin is like, who've known what despair is like, who've been right away from God and come back and found that he loves you. And so I speak tonight to second and third and fourth generation Christians in quotes and say that we'll never be able to mission 
to evangelize as the early church did until we become first generation Christians and discover Christ as Savior and Lord for our very selves. Now I've said the first thing about the early Christians was that they were all born again Christians. They all had the degree of BA and that's the degree that every Christian needs the qualification before they can set out on mission. But there was a second thing about these Christians. Not only were they all born again, they were all spirit-filled. And there are other sorts of Christian. Do you know what I did this afternoon? I took my Bible and I read the book of Acts and I deliberately missed out chapter 2. And I started at chapter 1, verse 1, and I just read on to the end of chapter 1 and then skipped a couple of pages and read on from chapter 3, verse 1. And you know, it didn't make sense. Just didn't make sense. But how many of us are trying in our efforts for Mission Unlimited, for outreach, for what have we, how many of us are trying to have the rest of Acts without chapter 2? That's the message that's come home to me. You notice that it comes at the beginning of their mission, not at the end as some reward for faithful service, but at the beginning. That's when they needed it. And it was this that explained what happened. These people were full of God's Spirit and therefore they overspilled. Their evangelism was spontaneous. Nobody organized it. They went. Wherever they were scattered, they preached the word. I love the Anglo-Saxon version of Acts 8 verse 4, which says, And they went everywhere gossiping the word. And that word gossip has become a horrible word because it's lost its meaning. It originally had a D in the middle of it. It was originally Godship. And it meant someone who had a godly interest in other people. Somebody wanted to share with them the blessings of God. Godship. And somebody crossed God out of it and all that was left was gossip. They went everywhere gossiping the word, Godshipping the word. It overspilled. When Christians are full to overflowing, you don't hear of any conferences on evangelism. You don't hear of any committees meeting for strategy. You don't even hear of training conferences. What you hear of is a burst of life that is reaching out in love and burning fire. Wind and fire came in Acts 2 and those are nature's two most destructive elements. They're the two most powerful things we know in nature and they produce fear where they're busy but these early Christians were blown and burning. And here we've discovered the secret. Just think if we hadn't got Acts 2 in the book of Acts the most challenging thing I've read on my holiday was this sentence about the churches in this land. Can't vouch for the truth of it, it was just challenging. The writer said this, If God withdrew his Holy Spirit from our churches, 95% of what we do could carry on as usual you forget everything else I've said tonight remember that if God withdrew his spirit from our churches 95% could carry on as usual you could still have your refreshments you could still have your talks on all kinds of subjects to the men and the ladies we could still have services and I dare say we could keep you entertained for an hour we could still have the choir practice we could still do so much but do you know that the only things that happen in Millmead that will last for eternity are the things that God does? The only things that really constitute mission are the things that the power of the Holy Spirit does. And this is the message of Acts. And as I look at that early church, a group of Christians that had so many fewer things than we have, how much simpler was their love for the Lord? They didn't have a television to watch and an interesting program just at the time of the prayer meeting. They didn't have cars to wash on Saturday morning. They didn't have Yorkshire pudding in the oven on Sunday. They gave themselves to the Lord that got their priorities right. 
And I'm coming now to the four questions which the book of Acts has left me with. I don't know how you feel after studying Acts. Some people feel very depressed. They feel that the gap between the early church and our churches today is so wide that they just get thoroughly depressed and say we'll never make it. I've told you many times the parable of the pessimistic plumber, but I must tell you again because it's so appropriate. The plumber who was sitting in his fireside chair one morning looking down in the mouth like this and reading the papers and his wife said, why don't you go to work? And he said, I'm too depressed. Why? What's the matter? Well, look, in the papers it says that last night Sharp Frost says that there are 10,000 burst pipes in the London area alone. I just can't face it. But his wife pulled him up out of the chair, pushed his coat on, pushed him out of the door, said, off you go to work. And he came back at lunchtime smiling and happy and whistling. What's got into you then? He said, there are only 9,998 burst pipes in London. <laughs> and though the gap is great between the book of Acts and ourselves, it's not an unbridgeable gap. And the thing to do is not to get depressed about the gap. Nor is the thing to do, and I want to underline this, nor is the thing to do to criticize churches or Christians and tell them how far they are from what they ought to be. That doesn't do anything either. It's to get up, roll your sleeves up, take the first steps towards that. Other people read the book of Acts and they get overexcited. This is the opposite extreme and they want to drop everything and rush out, shout hallelujah straight away and they're looking for an instant revival. And in the day when we have instant everything else, people want instant revival. wonder if there's any such thing. I've read the stories of many revivals and I don't think any of them was instant. I feel neither depressed nor overexcited when I read the book of Acts. I feel deeply challenged by four basic questions and I want to leave these with you tonight. Question number one. Do you honestly believe that these things of which we read in the book of Acts can happen today? Do you? Do I? I come across two sorts of unbelief. One is Miracles never happened at all. And you can explain away all the things in the Bible in terms of coincidence and natural event. Well, that's the unbeliever's attitude to miracles and the power of God. But I me meet a more subtle kind of unbelief among Christians, and it's this. Miracles happened within the covers of that book, but not today. I'm prepared to accept them then if you'll keep them within black leather. But don't put them in jeans and a sweater. That's an unbelief that is due to one simple thing. It's due to the fact that you accept the power of God with your head, but not with your heart. Who was it said that Zacchaeus was up the top of a tree and had to come right down the tree to find Jesus? We only need to drop 12 inches from here to here. It's not whether you believe in miracles in the Bible with your head. It's whether you believe in the now God in your heart. But we say the apostles have died. Yes, but has God died? But we say we now have the scripture. Does that mean we don't need the spirit? A world that doesn't read the Bible has got to see something else. And the first question is, do you believe that these things can happen today. Because the simple truth is they are happening today to those who believe. I hope you'll read that book, Like a Mighty Wind, the story of the revival that's going on right now in Indonesia. Water changed into wine, the dead raised, people walking the water. Things you thought you only would read in a Bible, but do you believe them today? Do you believe they're happening now? They are to those who believe. But do we believe in our sophisticated materialist society? The very mood of the world has pressed in on my mind and I find it is an effort for me to believe that God is still the same. That's the first challenging question. Is the God of Peter and Paul my God? The second question that Acts has left me with is an even more disturbing one. Do you want these things to happen today? 
All right, you believe in their in your heart that they can. Do you want them to? And the honest answer from many of us must be, no, we'd rather not, thank you. For to live in the Acts of the Apostles was a very disturbing experience. Things happened that were unexpected. Members, church members, dropped dead after the collection. Great fear came on them all. Do you want these things to happen today? Not sure that I do. Because it's going to disturb. It means that the church is no longer under the safe control of a trusted pastor. It's under the untrusted control of the Holy Spirit who can do anything. And you never quite know what he's going to do. It's always good. But you're constantly surprised. Do I want these things to happen today with all my heart? Would I love to see God moving in and moving out? Because it's going to shake an established church to its roots. It's like new wine in old bottles and it'll crack so much. Well, Lord, all right. I'll try to want it. I don't want to play safe. I want to see you working. Then the third question comes. Are you prepared to meet the cost of these things? Revival is not cheap. It's a costly thing in terms of sacrifice and suffering. Revival is very costly. You'll have to let your pet sins go as soon as revival comes. It's one of the things that keeps me from praying from revival. Oh, let's look at this third question. Are you prepared for the cost? Let's just think in terms of one thing only among many. Time. How much time does it cost to have revival? You look back to the revivals that have come when the power of God's been poured out. You'll find Christians who meet daily for prayer. That's what you'll find. You'll find Christians who give not just a little bit of Sunday that they can spare from the family life, but the Lord's day becomes the Lord's day. I've got a letter here from Fred Flack, who's just got back to India, and he sends this letter about what's happening there, but... Listen to this paragraph. It's now 9.30 p.m. Sunday. The day's work is ended. It reminded me a little of Sundays at Millmead, full and profitable. We were around 700 gathered this morning, a good cross-section of Indian society, young and old, rich and poor. About 12 young people were baptized. That started, that started the morning off. And from then the service ran through from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. About 600, including children, stayed for the midday love feast, which is customary here. Plenty of opportunity for fellowship. Then the young men and young women had separate classes. And later the former went with the older men for open-air witness before the evening service at 6.30. A full and happy day, praise the Lord. Tomorrow, a public holiday, and so the church is going out, about 130 of them, brothers and sisters, for evangelism in a distant suburb of Madras. It's wonderful to see them using their holidays like this. They come back rejoicing. And we get grumbles and complaints if a service goes over an hour and a quarter. And when a public holiday comes, seaside is the first thought. Am I prepared for the cost of revival? The cost in terms of time. Giving God the priority, not what I can spare, not what's left over after I've done everything I want. Or not, will I turn up if I have nothing else to do or if there's nothing else interesting to do or see or if I want to work overtime to get a bit more money. But does God have first call? Am I prepared to meet the cost? The fourth question that Acts leaves me with is this. Do you really feel we need these things today? Can't we do without them? The sad answer is that a lot of our activities could. But in God's sight, the need is desperate. Desperate. For when we stand before our Lord, he will not ask us how many meetings we held at Millmead, though the figure's pretty high. He will not ask us how big the congregation or the collection was. He'll not ask us these things. He will say, how many children have you had? How many children? Do we really feel we need? 
the barometer of a church is always its prayer meeting. For the quantity and quality of prayer reveals how needy that church feels. And if the prayer is poor, then the church is saying louder than words, we don't need God's help, thank you. We can manage very well on our own. But a church that sees that in the light of eternity only what divine power does among us will last. That church will be a church that will pray and pray and pray until God sends the blessing and until people are overspilling, until they're full to overflowing, until the Spirit has free course. See you on Tuesday evening. All right? Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, as you look down on this congregation, what potential you must see. You did so much with just 11 men, 120 men and women. What could you do with us? Lord, you have not changed. You're not dead. Your spirit has not been withdrawn. So, Lord, we come very humbly now and on this Sunday evening in August, we look ahead to this winter's work and outreach. We think of the churches of this town thinking about mission. And Lord, this word that I've spoken tonight, I believed you wanted said. It's not been very pleasant. But Lord, without you, we can do nothing. Nothing. But with you all things are possible. And therefore we plead, O Lord, that in the coming months of this winter you will give us such a burden for your power, for your fullness, for your overflow, that our hearts will be led and your heart will be pleased. We do not ask this for the sake of ourselves. Lord, it hurt when our German brother had been told to come and look at this church. Lord, we want people to look at you. We're glad to see him among us, but we want people to look at you. We want people to know that you're alive and active and that we are your people and that anything that happens among us that's good is your doing and marvelous in our eyes. So, Lord, hear our prayer and increase our desire to be individually and collectively together as a fellowship, all that you would have us be. Lord, fill us to overflowing, we pray. For your name's sake. Amen.